This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. From ESCV 2023, this is TWIV, This Week in Virology, a special episode recorded on August 30th, 2023. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast all about viruses. Today we are in Milano, Italy, and we are at ESCV, which is the European Society for Clinical Virology. I think this is the 25th meeting of this society. This is actually a city I used to come to when I was a little kid, maybe five years old, I had two ants here, and I used to go visit them every couple of years, so it brings back memories. Uh, my guest for this special episode is head of viroscience at Erasmus Medical Center in Rotterdam, Marion Koopmans. Welcome. Hi there. Nice to be here again. Uh, you've been many times already on Twitter. I don't right? know how many, but uh, a couple of times, so, yes. So, so Ron Fouché, who I had <laughs> just the other day, he counts, and he has six now. Oh, okay. Oh, I, I need to go back and count. You have to make sure. I think it's, he wins. I think he wins. He wins, yeah. yeah. Uh, we've done many on multiple subjects. And I thought today we could uh, have a chat about different virus infections that uh, we haven't talked about very much. And so um, let's start with uh, SARS-CoV-2. You, it's something you gave and you talked about in your keynote today, uh, infection of farmed mink in the Netherlands. And I wanted to explore a few things about that. So how did you first pick that up, that outbreak? So I think this is because of lessons from the past. We've had bird flu outbreaks. We've had mm. particularly big and bad outbreak of Q fever. So following that, uh, there was a big you know, evaluation. And following that, we developed what is called the zoonosis response team. Ah. So when there is a specific new disease situation that is brought together, it's an expert team to say, should we think about uh, animal infections, for instance, or vice versa? If there's an animal infection, should we think about human risk, health risk. So that's what happened here. So because of that, uh, quite early on, uh, when the first report came of infected cats in Wuhan, mm -hmm. this expert team was convened and said, okay, how should we look at this? Do we need to worry about this? What, is, what else is there? And in that meeting, we discussed what else is known. We already had seen initial data from China and from the FLI that, that some of the you know, the big uh, farm animal species were, were probably not that much of a concern. Mm. Uh, but ferrets, for instance, were. They were infectable. They were the animal model. And from ferrets, then, it was like, well, then maybe we should also think about mink and other fur animals. So that's how that started. And that that's so the animal health service was there at the meeting. Mm -hmm. So when they started to see cases of pneumonia increase, they thought of testing for SARS-CoV-2, and that's how it was picked up. In pneumonia in the, in the mink? In the mink, yeah. Okay. So and this is like, and, and I think I've tried to explain this. So this is an increase in the daily mortality. Okay. Because they, every morning there will be dead animals. Right, if you have such right. a big farm, so it's point. 5%, so that's in a, in a barn of 10,000, I don't mm -hmm. know how many okay. uh, animals. But they saw that increase, and that's when they start sent animals for, you know, testing. For yeah. testing yeah. So what, what was the extent of the mink farming in, in the Netherlands at the time? So we had um, a little over 100 farms, mm -hmm. uh, but produced about 4 million um, animals, okay. skins, right, <laughs> essentially, right. uh, per year. So quite, quite sizable. Um, I didn't know about that. Not, not, I knew <laughs> that it was there, but not that it was that big. Yeah. Well, there's, that's what you find out then, right? We tend to be human focused, but as exactly. you say, there has, there's an interface, right? Exactly. So were they all positive at one time or, or just a fraction of them? No. So the first, there were the first two. And then, of course, it was like, okay, where else is this? And um, the uh, so uh, 
with because of this pre-arranged situation, there's also it was also possible to really push for follow-up action. Right. So this was like, uh, and because of Q fever, the human health uh, advice is taken more seriously now in animal disease problems. So I was one of the people that said, okay, you really have to look where else this virus is. Um, and uh, so what was done is mandatory uh, testing mm-hmm. of animals on the other farms and quite soon, you know, one after the other. The positive. Came down, yeah. So ultimately, there are, no, there are no more mink farms now in the Netherlands, correct? Exactly, because the uh, because what it turned out, is despite everything that was tried, it didn't stop. So after a number, I don't know how many, the decision was made, let's just stop all mink mm-hmm. farming mm-hmm. and kill all animals. That's what was done. Is there evidence that the virus went into minks from people, I suppose, and then back into people? Yes, and there is. And uh, then even back to minks and back to people. So we uh-huh. follow that from... Just that, that's of yeah. course the beauty of the genome, adding in the, the full genome right. sequencing. Sure. So we actually could see that jumping back and forth. So yeah. ultimately, what is the concern there that led you to discontinue mink farming in, in the Netherlands? Well, it was, it was really quite early in the pandemic, right? So, mm-hmm. um, end of April when this started. Um, we were still in massive containment mode, so tracking handfuls of people in, in, in towns to make sure that they were not spreading. And then there were these 10,000 animals yeah, in that same yeah. village. So to me, that was like, you know, this, these two, I cannot <laughs> okay, get them okay. together in my head. We need to do something about this because that it, it, it is too much of an uncertainty with a new virus that we are really struggling with to let this just pass. We don't know what will happen. And the, one of the uh, issues, of course, was what happens if you have that massive replication in mammals? Mm-hmm. What does that do to the virus? I, I don't think yeah, uh, sure. we can tell. Someone told me that at one point they were considering killing all the house cats in the UK. Did you know that? I did not. I would, that would have been a tough sell, I think. Yes. People love their cats. I mean... Yeah, and, and, and it's so different. It's so different from... So we've seen infections of cats, but then you go into risk assessment, right? So you have one animal versus 10,000. So what are the odds that, sure, that there is sure. onward yeah. transmission from that animal? Yeah. Um, yeah, I would just maybe keep them in the house as a, as a measure well, of killing them. To their credit, they did not do that. Yeah, I, I think that would have been a problem. So are there other animals farmed or wild in the Netherlands that you, you see are a potential issue as well? So this, um, not really. So we have seen uh, um, occasional infections, so in cats, uh, cats dogs, right. uh, Martin, uh, but um, these are relatively small populations of animals. Our country is so full of people that, that we don't have that much uh, mm-hmm. uh, wildlife, not large populations of wildlife. So, so that's less of a risk, I think. Okay. So as you know, in the U.S., we have a lot deer. of deer who are, have a high positivity for uh, at least seropositivity. Do you think that is a risk? For the U.S. anyway. Well, I think it's... Um, so I get this question. So we are looking at all these variants, right? Yeah. Uh, um, and then the, the what is the new name? BA 2.86 that we're worried about right now, looking at. So it's another virus that pops up, has quite a few mutations, but it, it's derived from the Omicron lineage. Expectation is the vaccines will still pretty mm-hmm. much... Uh, at least uh, prevent severe disease. But what if we had reintroduction of an alpha-derived virus or right. a delta-derived virus? Those var- variants uh, had more preference also for deeper lung replication, right. Right. caused somewhat more mm-hmm. severe disease. So, you know, you wouldn't want to step back to that situation, right? Well, but many people are vaccinated with ancestral vaccines, yeah, right? Yeah, so that would be... It could take care of it. So I, I would not worry about this on the short term. The question yeah. is, is this going to continue? Sure. 
and then in the so I just discussed this paper, a beautiful paper, I thought, a work from uh, from uh, Ohio, uh, th and they wonder whether or not this will burn out mm. in the deer population. I'm, you know, I think that's difficult because why would it? If, if we, we are seeing this yeah, virus not yeah. really burning out, even if there's a very high highly immune uh, population. So why would it be very different sure, than deer? Sure. It's interesting that alpha is, is predominating in deer, whereas it was outcompeted in humans, right? So it's still there, but the, there's much more delta more, yeah, in, in that correct. particular snapshot. I, I think you have to look at how these animals behave. Do they may, maybe have sub-communities that hang out more together than People, yeah, uh, yeah. maybe very different. Well, yeah. the, the, in fact, it would be interesting to see if an Omicron-like virus arises in deer, or not, because they're not immunosuppressed or being treated with uh, antivirals for long periods of time, right? <laughs> yeah. So they. Uh, so I think there is already some uh, uh, Omicron circulation. So in deer, uh, in deer, yeah. And uh, Martin Baer from the Friedrich Leffler Institute is really a big ap a expert on the animal health side. So he says he, that that's what he worries about, that the deer circulation mm -hmm. could eventually make this a virus that also can infect cattle, which I now see. the cattle is, yeah. is very hardly su susceptible. Yeah. But that's his worry. So maybe not only about... You yeah, know, yeah, yeah. Evolving viruses that then come back to humans, but maybe adaptation to ungulates, and that could also create problems. Well, it, when you're in a new host, you always worry about that, right? The same with mink. You worry that it can change properties for humans. Who knows, right? Yeah, and in the, I was, I, I, I'm interested to hear your views on the, I think this ch difference in the rate of evolution. Yeah. I find that fascinating. It I, is interesting. I, yeah. yeah. I, d I cannot really just I mean, the, like that the, uh, understand why that would be. The, the, I mean, the base mutation rate needs to be the same because it's a property of the polymerase, but yeah. the selection pressures may be different, and um, it, it's it, we need to study it more in deer to find out what's going on. We can get some insight. That's very interesting. It is. Yeah. yeah. I, I agree. I'm, I'm worried about chronic wasting disease in deer because again that's it could get into cattle and then cattle are part of the food chain and we've seen what happened in the UK when that sure. when prions got in the food chain so but what about the combination chronic wasting disease and SARS-CoV-2 so you have an immunocompromised yeah population in which who knows what could happen so do you think that other wild animals are also extensively in fact what about rodents does anybody look at that um there's some work that i'm uh, aware of and uh, already early in the pandemic mm -hmm. i think there's some, some publications from china that that showed uh, susceptibility of specific mice species I, I don't remember which ones so there's that i'm not aware of really big uh, studies um, so I don't know. I mean, you could think about, um, for instance, rat populations. Sure. There's a yeah. discussion about uh, could those cryptic lineages of so the the, the quite divergent lineages of uh, virus that that have been found in wastewater could they maybe right. have right. originated from rat sure. populations? Sure, sure. Like in New York City, right? Yeah, we have, exactly. We have many yeah, exactly. millions of rats yeah. in New York City. Yeah. I was going to ask you about that actually, but but before we get to that. Have you have you known any other virus that can infect so many species as SARS-CoV-2? I don't think so. I, I mean, flu I is pretty good at different birds, horses, different birds. dogs, humans, right? This That's particular this particular flu is quite wild as well, right? So H if you look at the the H5, H5 I mean, yeah. If you look at the host range of that one, that's massive, mm. both in terms of birds, so yeah, expanded yeah. to many different bird species than m many more than before, and to many carnivores. Or, you know, and, and and I'm sure if we really would start monitoring mm. that closely, that number will will further expand. Yeah. So, all right. Well, let's let's get to that. That's another one on my list here. So let's talk a little bit about wastewater sampling. Do you think? 
do you think this is a useful uh, epidemiological tool for, tool for at least SARS-CoV-2? I do. So right now, if uh, because what we see is the world is over COVID, right? Has moved on. So and and there's very little testing ongoing in many mm -hmm. places. So now, if I really want to know what is the situation, I look at the wastewater data. Yeah. Okay. So in the Netherlands, you do wastewater we do. sampling. Yeah. And it's I you know it's the most uh, you know it's it's really independent of someone who wants to go testing right. or someone who thinks of testing someone. So so I do think it's a nice uh, baseline mm -hmm. system. Of course, it doesn't tell you about disease, but um, the, 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 the thinking that you could combine or, and continue wastewater and combine that with some fairly basic level of monitoring of hospitalizations, mm -hmm. uh, you could actually have a way of, of saying and measuring is the variant that we are seeing now, is that disproportionately more severe? Sure. Because that is, with everything we know, one of the most difficult questions to answer. And I think this is, uh, that's one, one uh, thing that I find fascinating. We've seen the explosion of genomic sequencing. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, it's, you know, a new variant comes up. You can see that. You can tell that from the bioinformatics and the, and the, the, the data analytics. But then is the, okay, so is there more virulence? What is the, uh, is there more, you know, what, what is the reason for the increased fitness? Is that mostly immune escape or yeah, is there yeah. something else? And there you see you still really need the lab studies and for virulence also clinical studies mm -hmm. and those lag behind. So I think we have massively invested in the genomics, but far less in how do we keep tra up with the... Yeah experimental work that needs to combine to give these answers. So that's, I think, a big, big, you know, that's what we need to bring back together. Do you, so in the Netherlands, you do routine wastewater sampling for SARS-CoV-2? Yes, that's done now by the National Public Health okay. Institute and, uh, and some others. Uh, but yeah, that's routine. So I think what you, what you mentioned is a good point. If you see a new variant, you need to know if it's immune evasive because if, yeah. if it's immune evasive enough, you may have to adjust your vaccine strategy, right? Which is, I don't know. I was going to ask you, what, what are you doing in the Netherlands with respect to the vaccines? Are you still with the ancestral, or have you switched to... No, so there's been the uh, ancestral and then the bivalent. Bivalent, okay, same thing. And now the recommendation for booster with XBB, um, only XBB, right? because that's now looking at the data that seems to be the, the wisest. Right, right. Um, I think there's a bit of discussion globally also on how much do you want to focus on continuing to boost or to also suppress transmission, but uh, to me that it, I find that difficult to justify right now mm. since, uh, well, it, it's clear that, that blocking transmission, we are very far from that with... Sure. The vaccines and with these viruses. So, yeah. um, and then, so then, if you really would push for all age group vaccination, then you get into this discussion like, what's the risk? What's the benefit? And that's a big group. There's also hesitancy about mm -hmm. vaccination. So, I'm not so. I think it's wise to go for risk group vaccination and maybe then offer it boosting. That is. And maybe then offer it to people that, you know, just want to be able to be vaccinated, but not say, okay, everyone should again be boosted. Yeah, I mean, in the U.S., we have a big pushback on vaccines now in general. Yeah, exactly. Because of the COVID situation where it was mandated and people really are pushing back. And there's a big movement in the U.S. to remove school mandates for vaccination. And, you know, it's a political issue. Yeah, and it's the so we never went for mandates, although some mm. some um, you know social media debates suggest that was the case. But yeah. we never went for went for mandates. It was always discussed in the context of this is a recommendation. But you can if you're not vaccinated, you can also get access when you test negative, or you know the, mm -hmm. because of this big pushback, and we have already a history with. 
um, a group that does not accept vaccination for religious reasons. Right. Um, we've had that with polio uh, epidemics. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so, th so that's also why you know going for a full blown mandate was very very. Uh, Controversial it was heavily debated and decided not Interesting. to. Interesting. So, with it, without a mandate, what level of vaccination did you get in your country? Um, well, quite high. I don't know the exact numbers, but certainly in the uh, in in the highest risk groups, the the vaccination rate was quite high. And overall, no, I I I don't know the numbers, yeah, but well, it's a problem in the U.S. I don't think we could ever get high numbers without mandates and. History has shown that if you give people a choice, they will not get vaccinated. Paul Offit just told me he, he saw a family that all had COVID except for the father. They were all not vaccinated except for the father. And mm. He said, why did you get it? He said, I had to to go to work. Otherwise, he wouldn't yeah. have got it. Right? Yeah. Yeah. So we have a big problem. And it may be that historically we look back and say we, maybe we shouldn't have mandated because it's messing it up for all other vaccines as well. Yeah, so so we've had these discussions with you know vaccination rates creeping down, and then yeah, there was yeah. a lot of uh, engagement in our country with those religious communities and, and leaders in, of those right, communities right. on, um, and and that eventually led to a quite high uh, vaccination rate, uh, despite this, these these uh, uh, religious beliefs. But I think we have you know have a different movement now, which is much more. You know, it's more diffuse. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So it'll be it'll be important to really looking forward to see how do we carefully work with the vaccination portfolio. Yeah, I think I, I suggested that uh, maybe in the U.S. we're going to have outbreaks of measles and other diseases and, that kill children before people realize what they should be doing, and that would be sad because then kids die and it's not even their choice. That's true. And, and but I, what what you see now is the line of reasoning. But I know so many that had it and that just were happy and just had a, a fever. You know that's sort of the yeah, discussion yeah. that you hear. So people make different. I know assessments. I know. Well, you know what Jenny McCarthy said. You know who she is right. Yeah. She said, "I'll take the frickin' measles over the vaccine any day, right?" And, and yeah. she doesn't know what measles can do yeah. to a kid. Yeah. Anyway, I wanted to go back to the cryptic lineages in the wastewater. Do you see this in the Netherlands as well? Um, not so much. I'm I'm not sure how specifically they look at, into that. So okay. the no. So, so we look at that in um, immunocompromised people that are mm. under, uh, for instance, in a treatment regimen and. Well, if you start looking, you see quite a few people that uh, have not been able to clear the virus. So, right. So we know of, of patients that still are shedding alpha-like yeah, right. viruses, right. for instance. Right. Um, so that that we see a lot. And and they evolve more than other people would because it's a long-term infection. Exactly. Right? And so, despite, okay. so yes, they are immunocompromised, but there's still some immune system, because otherwise right. they would not be alive. But uh, So you think that might be one source of these cryptic lineages that are seen? And then the other one are the rats or some other animal that's shedding it, right? Yeah. Or the we found a cryptic lineage in mink, right? In Poland, right. I just mentioned. That's right, that's right. Um, th th so they've had a couple of uh, farm infections again, all with you know, recent viruses, and all of a sudden two or three in a row with this lineage that was very different from what was mm -hmm. circulating, very different from anything that has been seen. And, and, no, and no, has anyone studied this to see what what's going on? No, now? that's I don't know. I've been yeah. asking, but uh, that's you. You don't hear that then. That's then the local uh, agricultural authority, and you have to hope yeah. that they explore this. But my hopes are not so high there. There's so much that you need to do, right, with all the variants and lineages and cryptics. You don't have the power to do it all. Right? No. It's the same with, um, you remember, the introduction of Omicron in Hong Kong through sure. hamsters. Right. And those were bred yep, yep. somewhere in Eastern Europe. Yeah. And those are big breeding facilities, and we've seen pox in them. 
uh, and our SARS, and they are so big, maybe there's pockets yeah. where that continues to circulate as well. Yeah, well, I think one of the issues is that you have to do all this under BSL-3, and then not everyone has such a lab, and it limits what can be done. Yeah, right? definitely. Um, so one of the times you were on <laughs> TWIV was when you were part of that WHO committee that went to China, remember? Yes. Uh, and so I wanted to ask you, why does this origin debate of, of SARS-CoV-2 continue? I don't know if it's like this in Europe, but in the U.S. people are crazy about it. Is, is it similar here? Not as much, I think. But, yeah, uh, the U.S. debate does spill over, so... Mm -hmm. um, I'm sorry. I, <laughs> it's, I think, in part through political channels. Sure, extreme sure. Politi I, well, I call them extreme. Uh, but uh, but that's what you do see. Um, I think this is, uh, I, I find it fascinating. It is actually, uh, I think it's the, the world entering the scientific debate through the social media discussion. Correct. Where all of a sudden you're like uh, challenged on the scientific method and the scientific method hardly ever is 100% sure, mm -hmm. yet we say, given this and this and this, we think this is the most plausible, right? Now that is, in, with any experiment, if, if you ask a scientist, are you 100% sure, which scientist would say yes, right? <laughs> Uh, it depends and, on and the question, though. It says, are you sure that reverse transcriptase exists? Yeah, okay. Some, All right. It depends on the question. All right. right? Yeah, so, th okay, this kind of question. Yeah. Um, so I think that's what we're seeing, and I think that's, uh, in part, understandable, uh, you know, mm -hmm. questions where people say, but how do you know? Well, you can explain how, how studies work, how, you know, how do you get to the evidence, how do you work with the stuff that you don't know and that's very difficult to investigate, and how do you come to those conclusions. But the problem, I think, is that this uncertainty is also being used. It's actively being used by a small group of people that are, well, just in there to stir to stir a debate and to stir uh, mm -hmm. dissent. And I think that's really a dangerous situation. Um, so, uh, and I look at that also in the U.S., I was just appalled by seeing how uh, Tony Fauci was being treated. You know, it's fine to bring people to Congress and say, okay, hey, we really want to know exactly mm -hmm. what was going on, but the tone and the, it was like, you know, treated like a criminal, the same with Christian Anderson, uh, you mm -hmm. know, I, I uh, it's just, it's just, uh, I think it's scary. It's, uh, it's it, have you seen the movie Oppenheimer? Not yet. Um, we'll talk after that. Okay. No, I, <laughs> but, but I think that's a worrisome trend. And, and yeah. I don't, I, th I don't think we can, um, we should uh, go into the same mode and say, but we know for sure that it's zoonotic because we don't. You know, you can't. I think you should stay, stick with the scientific method, mm. um, and also demand for well. Then, uh, what is the level of proof? So, what I find difficult to digest is that uh, the core of a lab leak theory is classified information. Sorry, cannot be shared. Well, then, then you cannot discuss it, right? So that's then then you that that is uh, you know a, a, a sure method to paralyze any real mm. discussion, and I think that's a problem. You, do you, what would end the debate in your opinion? So we there was a similar debate about HIV. There was a similar debate about SARS one. What, what in this case do you think would end it? I doubt anything would end it completely, <laughs> but um, uh, thinking about Wakefield, for instance, you know, sure. paper retracted, person, you know, mm. disbarred, but the theory still lives, right? But, um, you know, seeing um, f 
from the one on market. There are supply chains with all sorts of animals. If you would go back, find, I don't know, breeding stock, mm -hmm. um, if I have historic samples and say, okay, hey, there we see it, January 2020, lots of zero positivity or something like that. If, if you really found a, an animal source that is, you know, a plausible route to the market, sure. yeah. I think that would be... Okay, yeah, I think it probably won't happen, but I agree with that. That's what we would yeah. need. Yeah, yeah. Uh, what happened to that committee? I thought it was going to be reconvened. They got rid of Peter Daszak and... Then, and me. And they got rid of you as well? I thought you were... Left well, the, so the, 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 we all thought this was the first step right. of a long process. Um, and, uh, so when we got back, uh, of course, things were not complete, but there was a lot of uh, information, I felt. And we had clear recommendations on some of those, you know, studies. Go further, tra track back, try and find, uh, source farms, try and do studies there, go, do large-scale population mm -hmm. serology. Uh, but that was also uh, met with the sort of the political statement. Sure. It's not enough. It's not good enough. China's not sharing. So, um, and we had some discussion about that. Uh, and then the WHO, Dr. Tedros, decided, I, I want a new committee. You can all send in your CVs. Um, you don't have to reapply, but we're going to post publicly. Mm -hmm. I said, well, if you post my CV publicly, I know what's going to happen. Uh, you're going to get uh, messages from people that think I invented the virus, made the virus, uh, made a crappy PCR that, that gives false positives, was paid by China, and so on. And that's, of course, what happened. Mm -hmm. And then that was, you know, that was, yeah... Then it was like, okay, maybe that's a, that's too much stir for a committee like that. So and th it's uh, it's unfortunate. I then think. there's no committee right now, essentially. There is. There's the SAGO. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that's the sequel. Um, it's the uh, WHO it's, committee. So yeah, it's, it's not experts. Well, it's yeah. uh, but so they are. I think their mandate is a bit different. It's more like, okay, how do we do this in general, and I continue see. to look back at. Um, uh, what happened there, but but so far I don't think they have been able to do much related to the Understood. Wuhan All right. situation. All right, let's let's leave uh, COVID for now. Let's let's do MPOX. So uh, it was pretty big in Netherlands, right? It was, yeah. Um, so where did the, where did the virus come from? Do do we have any idea? Because I know historically there always have been especially after smallpox vaccination stopped, there have been cases of MPOX in African countries, presumably near the reservoir host. Yeah. So where did these, how did these get into European? Yeah, that's of course um, difficult to know. Of course, what we have seen is, uh, there's the older studies from Anne Remoyne that I really like that show that there's really a gradient in the uh, MPOX seropositivity uh, depending on how close you live to where reservoir uh, habitats are. Right. So so that already tells you there's much more mm. frequent spillover than we, you know, right. we see. Um, and we have, of course, seen uh, that there has been circulation in Nigeria under the radar because we have had several exported cases mm -hmm. from Nigeria to, for instance, the U.K., so that tells you that there's an undetected level of circulation ongoing. Now that's um, also what you know was the first indication from the genome. So the virus genome had some uh, indication, a marker that mm. suggested it already had been circulating among humans for a while. So, um, mm -hmm. Signs of epoback editing. Mm -hmm. um, so. My best guess is that there is more circulation than is recognized, for instance, in Nigeria and maybe some other regions. We're now hearing from studies that they also see, mm. uh, which, which was not so much uh, told about before, that they see transmission in sexual networks. So 
I suspect that that's what what it was. Mm -hmm. So it was mm -hmm. already percolating, and then okay. from there, and somehow um, it got into a European sexual got network, into, and it, exactly, which was a random event. It just hadn't happened before, right? It ha it was a spark, <clears throat> and then it sparked in a spot where right. <laughs> transmission opportunity is uh, is abundant. So how did you? How was it uh, limited in the Netherlands? What was done? Um, well, the combination, so there was a lot of uh, uh, well, community engagement. We have mm -hmm. a, a quite a strong program also because of the historic HIV right. uh, uh, situation. Uh, so the uh, STD clinics, uh, but also the people that specialize in you know, engagement with a, a gay community, with a high-risk community, uh, they all were, were at it. They were working with for instance, the organizers of the Pride uh, Festival, uh, with uh, people that, that had party mm -hmm. uh, centers uh, associated mm -hmm. with Pride, um, and they, you know, informed and listened, this is going on, this is how you can recognize this. They showed images, they were on site for people with questions, um, and uh, so that was done, a lot of that. And then testing uh, mm -hmm. uh, offered freely, and uh, we decided to deploy the vaccine, uh, which we had stockpiled for the event of a resurgence of smallpox. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so that was done, and we were lucky. In, I mean, we were a country that had stockpiled. Um, so, and because of that, we said, okay, we also must then study this because mm -hmm. we are, you know, we have a luxury position here. If we give these vaccines, at least we should also learn on what happens, what, you know. So, so there was that. Um, uh, so we did also study the immune responses. You, right. you, you looked at one of the papers, right? <laughs> yes, um, I got you mad. Yeah. yeah, we had a bit of a debate <laughs> on there. But it's really, that's why um, we did it. Because I felt you cannot just be, you know, be the rich country that has these vaccines that are not in Nigeria just hand them out and not even looking at what they do to a different virus. Yeah. So, so that's why that was. Who got the vaccines? Um, so really the uh, high, so high risk, high risk uh, community, that's of course difficult to know, but um, it was um, offered to people that also are on a prep for HIV, mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. that's, mm -hmm. that is an, at least a known high risk community. And then it was also uh, advocated through those different locations that you can go and you can come to the um, uh, STD clinic for and, and get your shots. And that's still available. You can do that today. It's still available. Um, there's discussion now whether or not that sh this should continue. Um, uh, and I think, well, the virus isn't gone. We've heard last few weeks, uh, huge numbers in China, not clear mm -hmm. what's going mm -hmm. on there. Uh, so if you have it available, um, I would s certainly continue to use it. The discussion that I, I think needs to be had is uh, there is shortage of these vaccines. Mm -hmm. um, and the question is, we are very much down now, but there's this low level circulation. Can we eliminate it from this particular niche? And what would be the best way of doing that? Could we do that by maybe sending our vaccines to other, you know, hotspots mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. where a lot of, you know, people convene to have parties and, and you know, have high-risk uh, contact? But that's a, you know, it's difficult. It's every country yeah. making their own decisions. But I think that's really what should happen. Can we push this back out of the niche where it's in now? And also focus on the countries where, mm -hmm. where they have the reservoir contact and the spillovers and, and right. what can be right, done right, there. Right. There's also people who are not in the typical risk population that get it. And so if someone went to a clinic and asked for a vaccine but wasn't in a risk pop, would you give it to them? Or would they well, receive it's not, not so you. much I know it's my not decision. But that, that they would here, I don't think they would get it. Okay. No. And that's because, you know, there's a very limited uh, yeah, number sure. of doses, enough to immunize, well, the, the, the high-risk community, but not... Got it, yeah. 
Lightly. So do you monitor MPOX in the Netherlands at all? How do you do that? So that's through uh, the STD clinics okay. and, uh, and also GPs now. So, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. so that's going on. Um, uh, so yeah, that continues. And, and um, it's, you're still detecting it now? It's, well, it's not no, zero, it's right? Very, it's, it's very rare. It's okay. very rare. All right. Yeah. Let's, let's go to H5 avian influenza. I just talked to Ron Fouchier a couple of days ago. It becomes a depressing uh, <laughs> overview, right? Well, actually, he has a... It's you know his position. He's not too worried about people because his says well, the mutations that are worse and haven't really amplified yeah. in the mammalian uh, infections. But he says it's a different disease, and we're not sure if vaccines and antivirals will work in humans anyway. So he has that reservation, although... Yeah less concerned about it actually doing something. So what do you think? What, what's the level of concern? Um, my concern is I don't think, I don't see an immediate human health concern. Uh, I, I do, because, uh, you know, I look at this as yet another example of a really a dramatic shift in the mm. ecology of, a, of an infection that we thought yeah. we knew where it was. And it's situation pre and post 2020 is totally different um, so to me that then says okay then we better prepare for surprises because mm -hmm. we don't know if you have so many species with that amount of disease what does that do to the ecology of all sure. sorts of things so so I'm not that much worried immediately about uh, mm. this triggering a pandemic but it's it's a very disruptive situation um, you know imagine if this would be in humans you know with the case fatalities that we're seeing or if it, it's very difficult to know what exactly a case fatality is yeah. in wild birds but at least there are lots of fatalities um, what happens we've seen examples of, of complete birth cohorts being wiped out of major bird species mm -hmm. what does that do to their ecology and, you know, with everything yeah, yeah. that they have. Well, Ron and I also had Rafael Medina on, who has been studying the Chilean uh, outbreak in uh, seals, right? In the seals, yeah. He's worried about the animals yeah. more than humans because, yes, there's a die-off and that has ecological consequences that we don't know about. Yeah. And that's harder to deal with because wild animals... In California, they were, they're vaccinating the condors, right? I saw that, yeah. that's. A, I think that's... Um, yeah. So that's an approach, a but it's... <laughs> it's not really uh, widely applicable, no, is it? It's well, rabies you could do with, with terrestrial animals, but a lot of these marine mammals, it'd be hard to, uh, yeah. to vaccinate them. But we have to be uh, creative. This is a time when scientists get to be challenged, right, and do something different. We did it with mRNA vaccines. You can do it again. Our, there's no limit. Yep, but this is a tough one, isn't it? It's I mean, very how hard. do you? Yeah. That's that's exactly why that's what I try to uh, uh, move to. Can we actually can we actually prevent some of this? Um, mm. You know, it's hard. I agree. It's yeah. very hard. Um, do, do you think it is transmitting among H5 is transmitting among the mammals that have been infected? Um, well. I think it's difficult to know. I think that, well, there was clear evidence of transmission in the mink in Spain and in Finland. Um, mm -hmm. We see, so we've done a survey, we find, you know, 25% of wild carnivores seropositive could all be one on one. Right. It could all be one on one infections. Right, it could be. There, yeah. it's, it's very difficult to know, isn't it? It is. Um, yeah. All right, but, so but, but, if you, by an analogy, I say, well, if I see it in mink, then why not in other wild mammals? Yeah, I agree. I agree. So here's a question we get all the time. So I'll ask you. People are worried about having bird feeders in their yard. Should they be worried? Wild birds coming and sitting, should they be concerned about that? They're gonna... No, I don't think so. But don't, you know, sit and, and you know handle them wisely, <laughs> you know. Well, it's, you know, it's that, not, they have to fill the feeder after the birds are gone, so they, there could be some virus left behind. Yeah, well, then... Be careful. 
Wash your hands. Wash your hands. But otherwise, people have asked me, should I get rid of my bird feeder? I, I don't think for bird flu, unless, uh, but it's a good question. Okay. Yeah. All right, so I want to get to One Health, but one more virus I want to ask you about, because you used to work on this, and that's polio virus, which has really become very interesting. And um, I wanted to know, so, so in, in the Netherlands, you use inactivated polio vaccine, right? Which you have published, you show it doesn't give intestinal immunity unless you've previously had oral polio vaccine, mm -hmm. right? Uh, so do you do you monitor wastewater in the Netherlands for yes. polio? Oh, you do? Yes. Do you know we don't in the U.S.? Well, that's not smart. <laughs> yeah, it isn't smart. It's CDC for 25 years said we don't have to do it. And then they had to look in New York, and they found it. Right. And certainly for polio, which can go so well under the radar. Sure. You know, where the, where yeah. the disease to infection ratio is so... Yeah, it's different. Huge. Yeah. yeah. So in the Netherlands, you you don't find polio virus in uh, wastewater. No. Well, every now and then it's 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 found, and then can be, uh, and then it's immediately followed up. So we've had a mm. couple of uh, situations where there was uh, something with the production plant. I remember that. Yeah. 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 Mm. But that's of course an exception. Sometimes you find a, a vaccine. Right, someone comes in who's yeah, gotten was, OPV. Who has yeah. uh, had OPV, uh, but we, no, we haven't had wild polio. I, I think there's an interesting. I was going to ask that question when with the wastewater talk, but it, um, what we see now with the whole wastewater uh, surveillance debate. So you see this genomics revolution also mm -hmm. in the, in the wastewater field. That's great. But what I see is discussion about. Uh, the quality of the data, and it's only good enough if you have uh, X fold coverage, 90% of mm -hmm. the genome. That's not, you know, I, I'm telling people in my lab if, if it's two reads of polio and it's really polio, I want to know about it. Sure. Yeah. Uh, so <laughs> I think that's something that, that really yeah. needs to be uh, looked at in the wastewater field. How do you actually do that? There's, of course, contamination questions you always mm. have to be careful but there for for uh, it's fine for norovirus or something to say okay i just only if i get full genomes i will use this data but not for something like polio where the earlier you can pick yeah, it up yeah no uh, these are things it's a new field right it's definitely so a new these field. are things that need to be established yeah so why don't we have uh, polio and wastewater very often in the netherlands we're using ipv our intest your intestines are susceptible so why well because there's not that much circulation anymore right so we, well in africa there's a lot yeah but so so um and we don't not look introductions you guys look yeah but in the U.S., I'll bet every major city has polio virus in wastewater. And CDC you doesn't want you to yeah. know that. So London had that, right? Yeah, and, and Israel they, too, yeah. So London, I think that was very interesting. They have picked up local circulation of polio, fix, mm -hmm. uh, drifted vaccine drive, yeah, yeah. Um, in multiple uh, counties and started an enhanced vaccination program without a single human case. That's interesting, isn't it? It is. That's yeah. moving towards, that's moving in the direction of what I call, well, close to primary prevention. It's still, mm -hmm. still, of course, circulating in people then, but, well, but that's really what you would want to see. If you can eliminate disease, it doesn't matter if it circulates, but then you have to keep vaccinating. That's yeah, the thing. That's right? the thing, yeah. Now, the J.J. Miranda, who talked about wastewater sampling for influenza. I want to know if he uh, is looking for polio. I would like him to look. You don't think he's looking? Huh? I don't think so, because he should. But if he asks the CDC if he can do it, they will say no. Because I know other people in the U.S. who have done that, and they say, no, you, you, you can't do it. And the reason they give is because it's, it's a risk, but that it's not a risk. You well, what is there the risk for the people handling the... Yeah, that's what they would claim. It's a, it's a containment risk, but that no. I don't think that makes any sense at all. I think they don't want us to know how much is actually circulating. 
Anyway, so you do you think you, we could eventually eradicate poliomyelitis, the disease? Um, I think it's. Uh, I think the, the simple answer is yes. Mm -hmm. The complication is more in the societal, the social That's science right. bit. Yeah. Yeah. You know, as long as we see people that go out to vaccinate being killed, you know, that there's that, that that's yes. very different reasons okay. why this may actually fail. And what about virus? Could you eliminate, could you eradicate polio virus like we eradicated smallpox virus? Well, the, the, the theory has that it should be possible, right? Because there's no known animal reservoir. But there's one other requirement which was fulfilled with smallpox, that every infection is symptomatic. So, was that really the case with smallpox? It, it I may mean, not if have you, been. You need to get really down the yeah, R not below question. one, right? I think the, the key is that asymptomatics do not contribute to transmission. Okay, and so there may be some. It's more but, difficult if you are. Yeah, so you polio, as you said before, 99% of the yeah. infections are yeah. silent. So, yeah. unless you have a really good wastewater surveillance like you do, well, but, but of course we have the mucosal vaccines, right? So we are a little bit the, the exception with the inactivated vaccine. Well, all of the U.S. But that's, uses that's activity, now, yeah. yeah, that's, but, but if you have big parts of the world, uh, still with the mucosal yeah. induced immunity, that would really, you know, that, that helps in cutting down circulation, also asymptomatic circulation. That's, you know, and Albert Sabin used to say, if you immunized everyone at once, you would eliminate yeah. the virus yeah. because everybody would now have intestinal immunity for at least a few months. Yeah. So if we could do that today, that would eliminate it, but we can't because of the problems that you mentioned. All right, so let's end up by talking about your, the topic of your keynote, which was one a one health approach to preventing outbreaks, epidemics, and pandemics. What is one health, and how can we use it? Yeah, so one health is uh, really an essence that you look at health of humans, animals, ecosystems as mm -hmm. a, a combination. Um, so not separate, and it's not one is more important than the other, but it's really uh, we have shared ecosystems, mm -hmm. um, and the whole complex needs to be healthy for the individual components to be healthy. That's sort of the thinking. Um, that sounds a bit holistic. It is a bit holistic, sure, sure, but it sure. does make sense if you really look, think through at some of the examples. It's it's also so. True One Health focus also says, okay, the, the uh, dying off of insects is also mm -hmm. a One Health problem. Um, of course, we have, I think, or at least the discussions I'm familiar with in One Health are, have mostly been focused on human disease, sure. emerging diseases, mostly focused on humans, but that's where this is moving. And it's interesting, so I'm in this uh, One Health uh, panel for, mm -hmm. that advises the, the, the different organizations. And we have people from very different walks. And we, we you know, it's, it's amazing how often you, you catch yourself and saying, I'm, what I'm saying is not really truly One Health. So that, that's, mm -hmm. I think it's an interesting way of thinking. I like it, even though I'm not sure. Uh, how to move forward with it, but I like it because it is, I do think there's a, a parallel between the complexity of health and disease and how we look at climate problems. Mm. So it mm. is way too complex to just single it out from, oh, we only look at humans and only if humans get sick, then you, you really miss a whole lot of the whole cascade of mm -hmm. events that leads to this. So that's what I like about it. What is what I maybe hate about it is how on earth do you then work with it? What does that yeah. mean? How right. how do we take this forward? So um, and that's that's difficult. So we just produced a paper 
saying, okay, what if you really, you know, if you take this definition to the heart, what would one health surveillance, what could that look like and who would need to do something? Mm -hmm. So just to start that discussion uh, and see, you know, th th there are elements that work. The, there was a presentation here by uh, Luisa Barzon of the surveillance that they have in Italy mm -hmm. where they look at, you know, the climate, ecology, mosquitoes, viruses, uh, right, other animals. Yeah, yeah and, right. and bring all that together. Now, that's interesting. That's a, that's a surveillance approach. Yeah. So what would a prevention approach look like, theoretically? Have, you must have thought about that. Yeah, so the prevention approach is what I'm thinking of in the example where, uh, so the, this nature-based solutions is a big thing, uh, certainly in, in our region. So we are really redesigning nature because of climate uh, problems that, that we see coming. And it, it's beautiful, you see wetlands, it's, it's, you know, it's wonderful. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But it also is, uh, you know, we know that land use change is one of the key drivers of emerging infections. So this is now us trying to solve one problem, potentially creating yeah. Yeah, a new yeah. problem. So. So there, if that's something we could really do together, then maybe that could lead to true prevention. Hard to know because you don't know if it even would lead sure. to disease problems, which yeah. is... That's tough. And then you have which, to convince the stakeholders, yeah. and especially in some countries where these, <clears throat> these actions are essential for economies and feeding people, they're not going to want to change it, right? Well, but once you get... So interesting bit with the, the land use change architects is that they are um, quite susceptible to, they're quite open to these mm -hmm. discussions, is my experience yeah. so far, um, because it also means doing, doing science and collaboration in a different way, right? Sure. And in a time when science and society is getting more contentious, right, as yeah. we have said, yeah. it's a hard yeah. time to introduce it. It's a hard time to introduce it, but it's also... Um, so we are just, you know, it's it's you drops, have to start. drops you have to start. on a hot plate. We're trying, we're experimenting, but what you see, yeah. it's very, um, it, it, yeah. So I, I think it's, is this an example? Um, so I heard this from someone. You that we we force bats out of their habitat in many cases. So we we should provide them a habitat. We should plant trees, eucalyptus trees, for example, so they can eat it. Would that be a one health? So, so then they stay in the in the forest and they don't come and deliver their viruses to... Yeah, or what was done with uh, Nipah, right? Where, yeah. where uh, once the bats that migrated because of forest fires yeah. from Indonesia um, and into uh, areas with pigs and with uh, bird, uh, mm -hmm. fruit trees and, yeah. and bringing stuff together, just realizing that, you know, having the animal separate from the fruit trees and, and also having those devices to, that avoid bat access. Right. Um, that's that to the palm set, but that's, to me, primary prevention. So it's understanding that there is an ecology. It's not saying getting rid of the bats or of the, the pigs or of the fruit trees. It's saying, okay, this is there. It's all there for a reason. But let's make sure we don't, you know, intentionally sure. press press it together. So the the first step is understanding the relation, the ecological relationships. Yeah. And so for NEPA, maybe and Handra, maybe we have an understanding, but we don't for SARS-CoV-2, right? Because we don't know no. the origin. So it's hard to do something if you don't know where it came from. Well, but for so for instance, in the bird flu situation, yeah, uh, we now so we have uh, new farms. Um, they need permission uh, to, on, on where they can build them. Uh, currently, the proximity of uh, wetlands is not a criteria. It could easily be made a criteria. Said, okay, you cannot build there because that's really mm -hmm. increasing risk. Um, we've had, you will like that one, uh, a decision now that, um, so we have... Uh, uh, Insulation of houses, so you have a double right. uh, built wall, and then you fill the space in between, so that, that uh, with a with some kind of foam, 
that works as an insulation, but bats like to hang out there. So now there's a new rule that <laughs> you cannot do that unless you have made sure there's no, no bats in there. Ah, that's so good. that's pretty yeah, good. That's good. Yeah. yeah. So I get the sense that this is a very long term process. But, yes. But you need to start the dialogue now and start to, to learn the ecosystems that you want to adjust in some way. Yeah, right? I think it's a mind shift. Uh, yeah. Change. Yeah, and I think it'll be in some places it'll be hard because in in many places it's all about humans, right? So I just was in South Africa where where with Tulio uh, and there was a tr training course with people from all over Africa and, mm -hmm. and uh, South America. Actually, I think and we had the discussion there. I think. Uh, it may actually be easier in regions where there's not these long established right. institutions. True. Um, so, th so they may actually start leading the way. That would be great. This. But in yeah. the end, if there's an outbreak, we still need to make a vaccine. Definitely. And not wait to try and alter and the ecosystem. Ahead of that. Yes. Well, that's another discussion. And now I'm going to let everyone go because you guys have been good in staying. And I know you want to go to the reception. So. That has been a special TWIV at ESCV 2023. Thanks to the organizers. Thanks to Heli Harvela for having, uh, for inviting me here. And thanks to uh, Marion Koopman from uh, Erasmus University. Always a, always a pleasure to chat with you. It was wonderful. Fun. Thank you. This is what I love about TWIV. You can sit down and just talk freely and people learn from it. So uh, that is... Um, to have, we are supported by our listeners, so if you like what we do, please uh, give us some support. Go over to microbe.tv slash contribute. I want to thank the American Society for Virology and the American Society for Microbiology for their support of TWIV, Ronald Jenkins for the music, and Jolene for the timestamps. You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week. Another TWIV is viral. Thank you. Thank you.